sing, church family? Would you stand with us as we worship the Lord together? The Bible says, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's praise our King together. Celebrate our firm foundation together. Help me out. Christ is my firm foundation. He's the rock on which I stand. 
when everything around me is shaking. But I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So I I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I build my life on Jesus. Cause he's there.
Amen. He's a good God, worthy of our praise, acquainted with every single detail of our life. And he's coming back. He's going to make everything right. Amen. There is a day coming when the old will pass away. Every wrong will be made right. No darkness, no night. The sun will light the way. There is a king coming. Yes, he is. The one who conquered death and grave. No more pain and no more sorrow. This hope for tomorrow is our hope for today. tension growing stronger. It's just a sign he's getting close. He's already on the move. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, the story has been written. We all know
Thank him, church. Thank him for his faithfulness. Does that song just get you excited, thinking about one day that our spiritual eyes are going to be open completely and he's going to come in physical form, riding on the clouds? Amen? So exciting. Our victorious king. And he's given us that hope not only for then, but he's given us the Holy Spirit. We're not on our own today. Amen? We want to pray for one another and uh, give you a chance to, to pray. If you have any kind of prayer need, I'm going to ask our prayer team to come forward. And uh, we know that the word says, the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. Prayer is powerful. The Bible says it is. And so we take God up on that offer. And if you have any kind of prayer need in your own life, whether it be for you or for someone else, we would lo love to pray for you with the prayer partner. You come down the front while we continue to worship. You can come and kneel at the prayer rail if you'd like to. So we know that, man, there's uh, all, all week long, we're praying for one another and hearing what's going on in your life. And there's a lot of heavy things that is normal that we walk through in life, right? And um, we talk about God's victory in our life. And there's the reality that there's ultimate victory. And then there's the, there's the already, but not yet, where we're in the middle of waiting to see how God is going to be victorious in our life. Does anyone feel like you're still in that waiting area and there's, there's something in your life that you're still waiting on God to come through anybody it's very very normal right and so we're believing God that for him to come through we need him to come through and for whatever reason he, he hasn't yet but we, we can trust him and I just want to just breathe a little bit of hope the scripture talks about the faith the size of a mustard seed so for a year, at least a year, I've been praying just some health issues, and I've had pain in my spleen, like, related to that. And so in our staff meeting on Tuesday, um, I mentioned that. We had a couple other people mention some health requests. And one of our staff members just prayed specifically healing for my spleen, and it has been no pain since Tuesday. Amen. Praise God. I don't know why it was Tuesday and not the other times I prayed, I don't know. That's the mystery of it. Maybe you've prayed a thousand times and God hasn't answered yet. Today might be the day. We know he's good. We know he can be trusted. And he's hearing your prayers. I want to read this. This is the kind of God he is. Psalm 103, 1 through 5 says, Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. This is his heart for you who forgives all your sins. Let that sink in. And heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Prayer is an opportunity for us to step into what God has for you. So while we continue to worship, you come forward. We'd love to pray over you. God wants to do a work in your life today to encourage your heart or even to change your reality. Amen. Let's continue to worship. You come. I 
Lord, we come before you today with gratitude. Nothing else uh, that we can bring except a thank you. Thanks for loving us, for saving us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being in this place today. Thank you for what you have in store for us. Thank you for the reminder from Roger, Lord, that you do hear us, you delight in us, you want to meet our needs, God. You have things planned, uh, God, that we um, don't even understand or comprehend. So Lord, we trust you today, we love you today, and we're a grateful people today. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen, go ahead and have a seat if you will. It's so good to see you this morning. Thank you for being here today. It's a beautiful day outside and I pray that your presence here and what you're gonna experience in the next few moments and what you've experienced in the last few moments will add to the beauty uh, of the day and uh, the beauty of, of our God that we serve. So if this is your first time to worship with us, we'd love to know that you're here. Easy way to do that. We make it as easy as possible. There'll be um, instructions or, or ways to do that behind me on the screen uh, through a QR code, a text number, or right in front of you, there's a card that says um, welcome if you want to fill that out. Any of those vehicles as well, if you want to let us know that something uh, God has done in your life, a prayer request or uh, an answered prayer that you'd like to share that we could we could uh, uh, celebrate with you, that would be, be great. And that's a, a good way you can do that as well. So please let us know you're here. I met a couple of people for the first time today. It's a great pleasure and we want, we want to know you. So thank you for doing that today. 
We, uh, we've given our time uh, of worship through song this morning, uh, through fellowship. We're going to pray that the way we interact with each other and the way we encourage and treat each other is going to be a, an act of our worship to the Lord as well. We're going to open God's Word in just a few moments uh, to Luke chapter 15, and we're going to uh, study God's Word, and, and then we're going to have a time to respond and give our lives again, once again, maybe or maybe for the first time to the Lord. Um, but also we have a time of generosity, of giving our resources. And I was thinking this morning about this time of offering. It really is, we're, we're, we're giving part of, part of the trust, something we trust in. We're giving one more trust over to the Lord every time we give of our physical resources. We're saying, Lord, we trust you with it. Not, I've got I've to figure out how, what to do with this, how to spend it, how to invest it. He wants us to do those kind of things but this belongs to you and I'm gonna give it to you and trust that you're going to take care of me. So today, if you wanna be a part of generosity, again, there's instructions on the screen, ways to do that, um, as well as an envelope in front of you that you can drop uh, in one of the offering boxes as you leave today. So make sure you participate. Give, give something today, the next step of trust to the Lord, whether it's through generosity, whether it's a praise through your voice, whether it's a step of obedience um, or response time at the end. So today we got a great, uh, great tweet, treat, a uh, great blessing. Uh, Kevin Phillips, our Minister of Campus Development, he came on staff about six months ago. So he's going to open God's Word for us today in Luke chapter 15, as I said. So Pastor Greg today is with our choir and orchestra from the Loop campus there at Carnegie, Carnegie Hall and um, singing this weekend. It's a pretty cool deal. And so it's a local day. So I've asked Kevin to share today. So he's prepared. You're going to love his heart. If you haven't met him before, he's just a real deal kind of guy and has a lot to share today. So great job this morning at 930. And you're going to, you're going to enjoy that. So get ready in Luke chapter 15 um, to take notes and to see what God will do in your life. So a couple things before we uh, wrap up this time and move on to our, our message time. Um, Hosanna Wong is going to be here Friday night. It's a ticketed event. Who's Hosanna? She is an author, a speaker, uh, a, a creative person. She's going to be here. Roger's going to, uh, and the band's going to lead worship. It's 15 bucks a person. You can still get tickets online if you'd like to do that. It's going to be a great night. That's this Friday, Friday night. And then tonight, if you signed up for Make It Your Church, uh, it's full, so don't, don't try to sign up today. We got the largest Make It event. Make It Your Church event we've had since we, we launched 11 years ago tonight. So if you signed up, make sure you show up, okay? Um, we've got Lupe Tortillas. It's going to be a great night with our staff, but that's tonight. So if you signed up, don't get distracted by it's nice outside. I'm going to work in the yard or I'm going to hang out. I'm going to go for a 15-mile run or whatever it is, okay? We want you to be here. So please, please be here for that if you signed up. So awesome. Uh, let's stand up and meet somebody around you for the next few moments. Introduce yourself to somebody new today. And ask them where their birthday is. We've got several people that their birthday is today. Good morning. Hello. I learned to turn my mic on. Um, thanks for being here today. We love getting to worship with each other and in a way that to be here. And I, I am a very humbled and privileged man to be standing where I am this morning. Um, having grown up in this church, having been called to God and through salvation and, and even developing a call to ministry and then for 30 plus years getting to serve the church uh, in Texas and Louisiana and Georgia, and for God to then to bring me back here, and in this moment, I've, which has been a blast for six plus months, but to stand on a pulpit, in, in, in the figurative sense, a pulpit, for the only voice I knew of, of preaching my entire life was John Mazzano. So uh, I'm not quite that energetic, uh, but he's, he's great, and I don't have his voice whatsoever. But, but to have that be uh, under incredible godly men for all these years, and then now to be back under the teaching of Pastor Greg and Pastor Jason. And then to be given this moment this morning is kind of cool. I'm not going to be lying. I'm excited about this. Uh, I'm excited about what we're going to be talking about this morning. But I'm obviously, 
uh, if you don't know, just very humbled by this privilege. Um, and so we're, we're going to jump into something today that I've been stewing on for a while since this guy, uh, we'll talk about that, who, who he is, brought this new concept of repentance um, that uh, is not new biblically, it's been there forever, but it kind of brought a depth uh, for me uh, that I've just been stewing with. And then when Jason asked, hey, would you be willing to, uh, to preach on the 25th? Um, and I said, no. And then he said, you are. And I said, yes, sir. Um, and so from that moment on, uh, I've repented from that conversation and learned how to say what we're going to say today. But in that, having the, the privilege to, to come here um, and to, to speak to this. Last week, Pastor Greg ended 2 Timothy chapter 2 with a challenge as we were being challenged to be, what does it mean to be an instrument in the hand of God? And in that, it was like, then how do we, in doing so, how do we have courage in doing that? And the final point last week, I was sitting right over here, it was uh, the ultimate goal of this is that we repent so that we can, our minds will be made new, or we, uh, we'll, we'll be able to have a clear mind. And not only have a clear mind, but we'll be able to understand what the truth is. It was 2 Timothy verse, chapter 2, verses 25 and 26, real quick. He uh, had the to instructions to the opponents. And he says, leading them, um, perhaps God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. And in that, I was kind of, I was like, love getting to hear Greg preach. And I was over here listening and all of a sudden I saw his last point was repentance. And I got very nervous. I'm like, no, that's what I'm talking about next week. And I got stressed about that. And I'm going, oh, God, don't help me because I'm going to have to correct this theology in front of his church. And that's going to be uh, so annoying. But no, I, thankfully, it was just a point that he got in. It's beautiful. But today I want to take this concept, this discipline, this spiritual truth of what repentance is. And my prayer would be that we would take it to a level deeper than we've maybe understood or re-engaged with in a way that God could say, hey, this is where, this is where I'm going after. So today we're going we're gonna to look at a, what re true repentance is, kind of bring a deeper definition to it. Again, I'm not undoing biblical knowledge. I've, I hope I'm, in, I'm in enlightening more in this area. And we're going to look at that through the lens of Luke 15. And Luke 15 has this, this incredible chapter where Jesus tells these three stories. And I'll tell you, you know, overview. He tells the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And in that, he is showing the beauty of what repentance does for the heart of God, but also what it does for us. And so we look throughout all of Scripture and we see this concept of repentance everywhere. Almost 70 instances of, of, of repentance from the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, we begin with Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it was perfect. And Adam and Eve walked in fellowship with God. It was it was a beautiful thing. Nothing was in the way of that. And they walked and talked and had this beautiful moment. But then there was a moment also that Adam and Eve chose to trade away from the perfection and the beauty of that relationship with God and to take one step in their own direction and going, I know he said this about the, the fruit, but we think being deceived by the, by the devil, but we think taking that fruit is okay. My way, not his way. And in that moment, sin entered the world. And it got messed up. And what we see, you and I see today in our own lives, but also a world that is ravaged by that, that we see the, the consequences of that all over the place. And so we see all throughout the Old Testament a, a call to repentance, to, to go back for that Garden of Eden before the fall, to go back to the beauty of a God who, who loves them. But in the Old Testament, it's all pretty ritualistic. It's symbolized by wearing certain clothes, sackcloth, you know, you know, real scratchy clothes to say, hey, I'm, I'm dealing with something, or they put uh, dust or ashes on their face. It was all this whole ritualistic thing that dealt with this concept of repentance being, I am, you know, sorry for my sin. I'm walking towards that. But then we get into the New Testament, and we see this concept, again, used more in the New Testament than even the Old. We see John the Baptist coming to prepare the way for Jesus, and his message was, I have come to prepare the way. I'm calling us all to repentance so that we'd be ready for what God would want to do through his son. And we see Jesus living his life and doing his ministry in a way that, again, points people to repentance. The New Testament term, it's a Greek term for repentance over and over, and over again, is this term in Greek called metanoia. 
And just real quick, I'm hopefully you're impressed that I said Greek out loud. And secondly, I want to assure you that I'm about two weeks smarter than you are on this Greek term. Um, I have not taken biblical languages. Uh, I, I, I love those who have, respect them. Um, you know, I, I have even gotten past the point that I think they're nerds. I think they actually love the Lord. It's a great thing. But for me, as I'm looking at that, I think there's beauty in finding, well, what's that word? Because a lot of times, and many times, we find that there is such more depth to that than the word we end up in English with repentance. And so, beta noia meta is mean around or even behind. It speaks to, to just kind of being around something. Um, in terms that we've used it, it's like the term for metaphysics. Physics is the ability to study the, what we can see, what we can measure, what we can figure those things out. Metaphysics is the things we can't. Uh, a new term that's in the social media world and that kind of stuff is metaverse. Uh, uh, it's something that's around, but it's not real, that we go into this place with the avatar and um, we, you know, can, can talk and interact as something outside of ourselves. That's what that meta looks like. So how does that apply to repentance? Well, let's get there. The next one is noia, is mind. And that is, it's kind of around or behind the mind. And in the simplest term, it is kind of, uh, rethinking our mind. In the Greek terms, when they use this, it's a significant changing of one's mind. So when we look at the term repentance, it's more than just stopping doing the bad things. It's actually going after and changing our mind, changing our thinking around something. But we've got that, but then we get into the biblical use of the word. And this, uh, if you've got your uh, read, listening guide, you can start filling in blanks if that's your thing. But the biblical use of the word is to change one's mind about their behavior and it infers regret. Change one's mind about behavior, and it infers regret. So there's a difference in this regret, because a lot of times some of our regret is we feel bad for what we've done, or we feel bad that we got caught. What this is pointing us to, the biblical view of this, is we, be, we have regret because what we've done is causing us to not be where we're supposed to be. Because what, we, what we've done, what, what our behavior causes is what we regret. It's more than an example, I promise you, of just doing bad things. It's acknowledging that we are doing, what we are doing is keeping us from the life that God offers us. I'll say it again. It's acknowledging the fact that what we are doing in the context of repentance, truly being the, finding that out biblically, it is keeping us from the life that God offers us. This next uh, blank here is that repentance is the first step to seeing the beauty of God's promises and wanting to remove anything that keeps, that keeps from experiencing them. It's the first step towards experiencing the beauty of what God promises and not the things that are about that. See, I had this messed up for most of my life. Um, I, um, growing up in the church, again, this church, uh, great folks uh, down at the Loop, I've got names and names and names of people that God used to speak in my life, but there was always a heart for performance and always a heart, almost a works-based thing, that in my walk and in my faith, it was almost a ledger. Not, it was a ledger. And the more good things I did, what? Then God liked me more. But whenever I got into seasons of more, there's more bad than good, I would struggle with the fact that God didn't like me and he was going to punish me, and I was waiting for the next shoe to drop, and that kind of stuff. It was this constant battle in my mind of thinking about repentance more in the context of my, the things I was doing bad and to, to stop doing those things. Let's see. Repentance and, and actually acknowledging that we've done, you know, that we've got issues or we've got sin in our life uh, that, was, again, started the garden. Uh, we, we still see it today. The, the issue on that is that is so much more than just stopping to do the bad things. Uh, Illustrative sake, I'm, I'm here on stage. I'm going to say, okay, I got Chad Roberts over here. I'm gonna, he's going to be the object of sin um, right over here. And so I am walking away from God. I'm walking towards Chad, and I'm like, oh, wait, this is not good at all. Thanks for looking at me, Chad. Yeah, I really, this is not good. And in my old mind and in my thinking and what I thought was performance-based, I would go, I've got to stop, turn, and go back. On the surface, that's not a bad thing because I need to stop doing what I was doing. But when it's all said and done, where did I end up? Back here. Not only did I end up back here, there is a part of this process that I feel like I owned. That I was, you know, I was doing bad things. And then my story about me is that I was able to overcome that and come back to here. And that is a, a, a basis of repentance, but it is not the true story of what repentance is. 
what true repentance is, and it's that, that next blank there, that repentance is trading up. Repentance is trading up. It means that I understand that there is something greater that I'm pursuing, that if I continue in this practice, if I continue in this uh, belief, in this process I'm walking towards, it will continue to, to bring me away, but trading up to says, I want to embrace what God would want us to see and to do. That is so much more than stop doing bad things. It is the beauty of what it looks like to say, I'm going to pursue what God would want from me. And so it's, it's the walking towards, uh, towards sin or whatever, and it's not the turning around, it's the, it's the trading up to that. And to all that that offers me, the cross, all that, that, that he gives me because of his grace. And the beauty of that is much more compelling than me stopping to do bad things. You, you get where we're going with that? And that's, that's our call today. I, I'm so grateful. A guy named Dwight Edwards uh, is, a, is a man who has been inf- is very influential in this church. He was Pastor Greg's pastor in College Station during his college years. And is a man that still has a voice in Pastor Greg's life as well as all of ours. He's, he's met with our staff many times. And it was him back in the fall that, as we're walking through something, he, he brought this, this idea of going, hey, let's look at repentance, not through this, but really through this concept, it's his, of trading up and what that would look like. It's not what I thought, but it's what God would want to do. So in order to get there, and we're going to get there in the beauty of, of God's heart through this in Luke 15, but before we go there, I want us to remind us, and I'll just, there's, this isn't your blanks, there's not a blank here, I just want you to, to, to key in with me, that the beauty of what we're, being, we're trading up to it's this, it's, we're trading out to the fact that I am fully known, and e- even in spite of the fact that I'm fully known, I'm fully loved by God. That I'm, I'm fully known and loved by God. Trading up to that versus what I feel about myself, or what I feel God feels about me. God's word tells us that while we are still yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the beauty of that. Secondly, God is offering more than I can ever give myself or gain from the world. God is offering more than I can ever give myself or gain from the world. Matthew 6, what? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. The beauty of what that looks like. Next, we're trading up to his presence and plan are the key to a life of purpose and peace. That his presence and his plan, the very presence of being with him like we saw in the Garden of Eden, but also his way of life leads to a life of purpose and one of peace. And lastly, we're tra- trading up to the fact that God's grace offers us an unending invitation to trade up to his kingdom and all the benefits that that gives. An unending invitation to trade up to his kingdom and all the benefits that that gives. And, and seeing that that's what we're being called to trade up to. So how, how do we get to that point? And I, the next uh, part of the, this message is talking about why do we repent? What's the reason? We repent, we trade up because why? And we're gonna look at that through the lens of Luke 15, an incredible passage that Jesus uses. There's four scenes here in Luke 15. The first one, quick, is, uh, involves Pharisees and their view of what's going on. And then the next three scenes are a, a, a story about a lost sheep, then a story about a lost coin, and lastly, a story of a lost son. And we, we see that lived out here through Luke 15. So let me read this first scene, which is verses 1, 2, and 3. We're in Luke 15, verse 1. It says, all the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him. Uh, And the Pharisees and scribes were complaining, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. It's one scene. We got Pharisees and their buddies. We see all these sinners and tax collectors coming to talk with Jesus. And then we, we have a statement from Jesus. So in this, we see the very heart of the Pharisee that they are seeing these tax collectors and sinners as unworthy. They, they, they see them. How can a holy person be with an unholy or bad person? And he's calling Jesus out on this. And, and, and in that, what we see in their heart is that they are not worthy of repentance, these people, these tax collectors, these sinners. And they are not worthy of God's presence because they have messed up. There's no way they should be there. And lastly, they're not worthy of even their presence. How dare them? That We would never be with tax collectors and sinners. How, this Jesus guy, why is he there? And we, we see their heart in that. But then we see the heart of Jesus. And again, I read some things uh, in Scripture that, I, that maybe we shouldn't, and y'all can pray for me later in grace and God. But I see this moment in verse 3, and then he told some stories. You know, he's like, I, I hear what you're saying, I see what's going on. But Jesus says, 
let me tell you what's going on. Let me, let me show you uh, what we're looking at. And so we see these first two stories that he is speaking to the heart of the Pharisees, but don't miss that. He's also speaking to you and me. And, and let me read the first two about the sheep and the, and the coins. And, and in that, we're gonna, that, that's going to give us our first two points that we'll unpack in a second. So starting in verse 4. It's Jesus talking in the, in the earshot of the Pharisees. He says, What man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the ninety-nine in the open field and go after that lost one he joyfully, uh, until he finds it? When he found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. And coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. Were the Pharisees listening? I don't know, but then he goes on. Or what woman who has 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found the silver coin I lost. Verse 10, I tell you in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. We, we see the beauty of that in, the, in the, the lost sheep, 99, but he goes after the one. The lost coin, she has the nine, but she goes after the one, and it does everything they can to find that. And that brings us our first two points. Why repentance? The first one is beautiful. It says we repent because God sees us worthy of finding. God sees us worthy of finding. We see that in the lost sheep and the lost coin. It's so easy to think like the Pharisees at this moment, and I promise that's a heart that I've had to, uh, to, to, to manage or to, to get, get away from in my own life and in, in my early years of ministry and that kind of stuff, of being more pharisaical than I was Jesus. But I, it's easy to think how they thought, why doesn't God just relax? He's got the 99. Why go after the one, is their thinking. You know, she's got nine. Why, what's the deal with the one coin? Why don't they just clutch onto that? Why go to such lengths to take such risk to just secure secure the one sheep or the coin? And Jesus in his own heart and what he's doing because because of this. Because God places such high value on the soul that belongs to him. There is great value there, not because we've earned that, but because he's chosen to do that. They are sheep and coins with owners, so therefore they are worthy of the pursuit. And Jesus is reminding the Pharisees, these people I'm with are worthy because they are mine and I want them to know the life that I've, I've, I've called them to. That we see that living out in all those, those things as we uh, follow through on that. Jesus is telling that story, tell, he tells us this through these stories that they're worthy of that, and that what he's telling us is that these sinners are there because they are his, and he values them. And here's the, um, here's the, the uh, spoiler alert. That's us too. As we live the life that we live, that as we stray from whatever we may be, that God would say, I will pursue you because of his love for us and that we would be restored. We, we repent at, in the very beginning to understand that it is something that God um, is, is, sees as worthy of pursuing, you and I. The second one there is it brings joy to God. When, when we see the, the, the conclusion of both of these stories, when the sheep was found, it set, shows this beautiful picture. The shepherd put the sheep on his shoulders and, and went back. And it wasn't just like, and get back in there with those sheep. It was, friends, this is something to celebrate. There is great joy. They are back with us. It was the same with the woman who was stressed and who was looking for this lost coin. And then when found, she invites her neighbors as well to celebrate. That's just not, it's not just a good story. Jesus is trying to remind us of how heaven reacts and responds when we truly seek to trade up to his way and to what he would have for us, not just us. That we see that. And then verse 10, you got the sheep, you got the coin. In verse 10 of this passage when it says, And I tell you that in the same way there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. There is joy and celebration in heaven when one repents. This verse alone destroys the narrative of this. I'm too far gone. I can never go back. I've done too many things. I, I've, I've messed up way too much. That There's no way I could come back to God. And God's going, no, 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 no. That is not what I see of you. It is saying, I, there is joy when I come back to you. One of the biggest inhibitors of coming back and, and making that, that, that choice to, to trade up or to return to that is that we fear 
the response is going to be like we would respond to somebody else. And we feared that there's condemnation, shame, and those kind of things. And the reality is that conviction is real and God uses that. But when he brings us back to him, that one step towards back to him, he is saying, this is great. We celebrate because of this. It brings great joy to him. God takes time to pursue every individual. And when that individual repents, God takes time to celebrate. And he invites all of heaven to celebrate with him. That speaks volumes of what God would want from us. And Jesus is telling that in the context of the stories, the beauty of what that looks like. And so it brings great joy. And the truth takes on even greater meaning as we look at this last story in, the, in chapter 15. As we see the beauty of what God is doing, this next illustration of the prodigal son had to even mess up even more the pharisaical grumblings that were happening in there. And so we, we get to the story of the lost son, and let's read this together starting in verse 11. And I just want to, it's a, it's a longer passage, but I want to encourage you, think in the context of story. Get a visualization in your head of what this looks like, the scene playing out, because it's, it gets pretty amazing. So here's the story. And he said, and also he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give them, give me the share of the estate I am coming, ha, you have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. And after he had spent everything, a severe famine struck the country, and he had nothing. And then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired workers have more than enough to eat? And here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up, I will go to my father, I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and he went to his father, but while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, he threw his arms around his neck, and he kissed him. Beautiful scene. And the son started, began his speech and said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And, but the father told his servants this, Quick, bring out the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fatted calf and slaughter it and let's celebrate with the feast. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And the beauty of this story is that, that Jesus is still kind of helping the Pharisees to see certain things, but it's also helping us to see why repent, why, why, why is trading up so important. What we're going to see now is the beauty of what repentance does to the heart of God and, and, and also to, to, the, to the person. And so we see this, this next point is that he began to realize, and we repent because in that we see that sin keeps us from the life God offers. Sin keeps us from the life God offers. This is what living apart from God and from Jesus looks like from the vantage point of heaven. God is a father who watches over us, who are rich but rebellious children who love to squander his love and his riches by going our own way. And God, and seeing those things, sinners want, want all the goodness, and I'm saying we, again, this is in a, lot of, a lot of points to us, we want all the goodness of God's creation, all the enjoyment of God's blessings, but we won't, don't want him himself. Like the son wanted all the stuff, but he wanted no longer to be in the presence of God. Sin does that. It takes us. It keeps us from the, from the life that God offers us. We see that. We've seen that in our own lives. We've seen it in others, but more about us. Unless God restrains, and, and it is it's a waste of their lives to look at that. C.S. Lewis uh, points this out. It's, it's in your uh, handout, but it's also be on the screens. C.S. Lewis uh, has this quote. It says, Our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak, as we're thinking about sin taking us away. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition with an infin when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum when... Uh, but, but in a thumb, because he can't imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. In that is just seeing that, that what the power and, and what sin does in our lives is it takes us away from that. I have a hard time correlating. I, you know, don't, I've never made mud pies in a slum, and uh, I've had some beach vacations, but, you know, but I don't compare that. So I was like, what's a better way to connect with that? And the better way for me is uh, 
to me, what God would offer as a banquet table would be a taste of Texas steak and salad bar and dessert um, and the Texas history to go with it because yay, Texas. Okay, so that is the banquet that we're offered to, but I am constantly settling for this, and I had to think, what's the worst thing I ever did dietarily? And there's been a few <laughs> instances, but this is the worst. I chose to spend money on crockpot tamales at a gas station. Okay, um, I saw that, they smelled good. I'm like, oh yeah, I'll get some of that. And so crockpot, plugged in, tamales, I bought some. I took them home, I ate them. They did not taste good. And they were much worse later. I don't know what that means, but if you can just, uh, it was like, that was a mistake. But in this mud pies, the beach vacation, it was, you know, it was me settling for going, constantly going back to this crock pot at the Exxon in Midlothian and thinking that's what life is when it's so not. It is Katy Freeway in the most beloved acreage of the world with a Papados, a Papacitos, a uh, Fuddruckers, and a Taste of Texas. Why would you want to be anywhere else? God's calling you to, okay, no, no, stop. Um, we're being called to that. But it's the same kind of deal that we are, we get so caught up in the fact that we think that is what all we're being offered, but we are far too easily pleased because sin takes us away from what God would want us to do. Repentance allows us to get to a point where we realize this is not good. And the son saw that, began to see that. Not only did he not have money, not only could he do the things that he wanted to do, but now he was starving. And in that, it does that for us as well. Life apart from God really is a slow death. Uh, a, a quote that is not mine, I, I got it, I didn't quote it, I can't tell you who it is, so somebody just let me know later, I will we'll do that, but it's, apart from God, we actually are living to die. That we are taking choices like the son did to go towards death, but with God and repentance, it is dying to live. What do you mean? Dying to self, so that I can truly know what life truly is that God has offered. I died itself so that I can live. And it's in that that allows us to find a life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And to see that. Sin takes us away from that. Turning from that goes for that. Repentance allows us to see that. The next point here is that repentance does this. It allows us to see that sin messes up our thinking and convinces us, convinces us that our plans are better. Sin messes up our thinking and it convinces us that our plans are better. We see that, obviously, in the, in the life of, of the son here. It, and we see that beautifully lived out when he, in verse uh, 18, we, uh, verse 17, excuse me, and said he came to his senses. And in coming to his senses, he, he was realizing this has made me, to, brought me to a point that I don't, I don't like, I hate. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to die if I keep going in this direction. In the same way, the same sin does that in all of our lives. Go back to the, where we started in 2 Timothy uh, 2.26 when it talks about and God grant them repentance so that they can come to their senses and realize they are an instrument of the devil, not of me. And, and to see those things lived out. But how did the son come to his senses? He did so by recognizing some things. He recognized, just like we do in repentance, we rec he recognized his condition. He was begging to eat and begging to eat what the pigs were eating. That was his life. He was working for a master who did not care for him. Because we see that because he didn't feed him. And why his father took great care of his servants. That was, he recognized that and understand what, what it looked like. He realized where his place needed to be. He needed to trade back up. And that was to be with his father who took care of his people. Again, you're going to see, and we see in his narrative, he didn't think, he didn't want to go back as son. He wasn't even sure how he would be received at the property line. But God was there. And then, so he recognized his condition, realized that his place, and he sees it's a beautiful part on here. He sees that his sins are against his father, obviously, but also against heaven, against God. And in that, he begins this trading, it be, begin the process of not just, okay, I'm just going to not stop doing this. I'm going to walk back, and I'm going to trade back up to what my father would offer us. And so we see that the sin got him to that place. Robbie Zacharias says it this way, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you'll ever want to pay. That's, that's the power that we see, that we know that. We know that pull in our lives. But when we talk about this repentance, and as we see Jesus beautifully telling these stories of going, this is what it means to, to the heart of the Father, to be found, to have joy, to see those things lived out. And so that sin messes up our thinking, 
and convinces us our plans are better. But the next step as we, we begin to turn the corner, now we're going to see the, what this does to the very heart of God. It says, when we repent, we're able to see this, that God's unconditional fatherly love will restore you. That God's unconditional fatherly love will restore you. And we see this beautifully carried out in the story that Jesus taught here. But also, here's where the gospel and the gospel story just defies logic. Again, as a recovering pharisaical mindset and the things I would say in my early ministry years and in my early walk of, you know, the, the story should have ended with, uh, and they saw the son, he got to the property line, they stopped him and said, get on, you know, you're not welcome here, uh, you've, you've got yours, you're, you're done. That's our heart. But the heart of our father and the gospel message says, no, something else. And it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. It, 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 an understanding, and here's where I want us to stay for just a moment, in this, the, this part of uh, verse 20. So it, it not only did he not, was he not rebuked, was he not, it says, verse 20, so he got up and went to his father, but while the son was still a long way off, get that in your mind, still a long way off, his father, father saw him and was filled with compassion, he ran, threw his arms around his neck, and he kissed him. to me, one of the most beautiful images in Scripture that we, we see in what Jesus taught us. That as, as we, we get to this point and we, we feel like we, we don't want to go back because of the shame we feel, because we think he's not going to like us, or more, worse than that, he's going to smite us, whatever that means, and we're going to go after that. But when God says, and he shows us his heart, it says, no, the son just had to initiate the journey back, and then while he was still a far way off, what? The father saw him. He ran. Not only that, he had compassion for him. The heart that was already loving the son to be back. He hugged him, he kissed him. He goes on to say that, hey, bring me a robe, bring me a ring. Let me put this on my son. Because, again, he starts to give his speech. I have sinned against you and I'm no longer to be called. And I wish there was a point in going, and the father goes, yeah, you're right, but. No, God, it, it, this story doesn't include that line. What the next line is, I don't even acknowledge your... You, that, that you think you can tell me who my son is, I am going to determine that you are my son. So go get, the, go get the robe, get the ring, which signifies my son is here in front of me. He wanted just to be a servant, if that. And the God, God the Father on this picture, and, and how we we're seeing that, he said, no, I determine who you are, and you are my son. And in repentance, we're able to see the beautiful condition of what it means to have an, a, a forever a unconditional father who loves and restores us. Not only that, he throws a party. He celebrates. Tie back into the, the, she, the sheep, the coin. They were rejoiced. The father does the same. Jesus is reminding us over and over and over again that that is the heart of God and how we are to see and to experience that out. So we see the beauty of that of an unconditional father's love. And then this last point in our repentance, in trading up, it allows us to see, and it shows the miracle of grace moving us from death to life. The son had been brought back. It was beautiful. Uh, another quote that I've um, read, is it, he was brought back not as a corpse for a funeral, but as a soul for a party. And that, that, was the, that was the determination of the Father to do that. And I'm telling you, Jesus taught those things so that you and I could understand that that's his heart for you and I as well. That we can understand the beauty of what that looks like, that it is death and life. Heaven celebrates, God celebrates. We see these things about angels celebrating when, when one repents. Why? Because from a heaven perspective, when we choose to go our own way, we, we, we are, we've lost fellowship. We've lost the beauty of what it means to be with them. But when we take that step back towards God and, and understand to trade up for what he would, would want us to see, that's when heaven goes, and he's back. She's back. And the beautiful celebration. Or the, the sin had you know, made them dead, but now they're made alive because of what they've done and accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so we, we see that all throughout here. We, we trade up, we repent because of, of these points. We are, God sees us as worthy of finding. Our repentance brings great joy to God. And we need to believe that. In our repentance, that we recognize that our sin keeps us from the life that God offers. Sin also messes up our thinking. 
and it convinces us that our plans are better. And then through the heart of God, we be, we are, we're able to see that his unconditional fatherly love will restore us. And not only that, it shows us the miracle of, of grace. And that grace is moving us from death to life. Every time we get together as a church family, this is what we're after. In order that each one of us can know this beautiful truth. Not, not in a way that just constantly says, you know, with my, my earlier thinking of going, we just got to remind everybody how bad they are, how bad you are. And that is true. Death has messed every one of us up. We, no one is righteous, no, not one. But the problem with that isn't that we are horrible people, shameful. We are broken, we are, but it makes us dead. But it's in Christ and trading back up to him that says, I will give you life. And every time we come together, we are trying to figure that out more and more as a church family. We are blessed as a church family to have incredible volunteers, hundreds and hundreds of you guys, who show up every Sunday wanting to help people in this. That's why we're called pathmakers. We call each one of those pathmakers. It's uh, why? Well, it's because we believe as they come on campus and as we pray together and as we celebrate together in this room before most of you show up, there is a point where we are going, what is it going to look like for us to create a path for those who are going to show up today, either the first time or the hundredth time, where there's a path where they can experience God. And they can see the beauty of what, is, what we're trading up to and to see, see that lived out. And th that is lived out through all of our pathmakers. And, and so we believe that so much that every pathmaker has one thing in common. They, are help, they help direct us as a church family to a preferred path of life so that we can know what we're trading up for, what we're trading up to. So when a parking team member out there, the first people you'll see with the beautiful orange shirts, when a park team member greets you with a smile and gives you directions to a place to park, they are initiating an experience where the difficulties of this world are addressed by what? By a God who makes a way in and through these difficulties. They are pathmakers that are helping with that. When a teacher in a classroom from a little kid all the way to adults, when they open up the Bible, they are working to connect a heart that has been damaged by sin to the very heart of a loving father. When our production team, incredible guys and men and women, when they press buttons, they set levels, they, they play chords on their instruments, they align with the biblical instructions to create environments where we can do this. We can experience the presence of God and develop a longing for the eternal joy we will one day have in heaven that we're trading out for. And then one more, when a prayer team member, beautiful image as they, they come and, and just stand in the gap for us in so many ways. When a prayer team member asks, what can I pray for? They are desperately seeking to be an instrument of God to remind you that whatever you need, this is beautiful, whatever you need, God is trustworthy to help you trade up from the anxiety, the grief, the, the worry that you brought to them and as a pathmaker to help go towards that. And that's who we are as a church family, trying to figure those things out. Not only that, it's for all of us. And, and this morning, every one of us who've heard this are in one of two camps. The first camp is this, it's somebody, and that's, this is where I am, who knows the beauty of being called a child of God, but in some way has traded that for wanting to do things in my power and for my pleasure. Our challenge today, for those of you that are in this camp with me, is to recognize where our sin is taking us and repent, trade up from doing that by choosing to trade up to God's way. But don't mistake this moment, brothers and sisters. Don't mistake this moment as thinking of an opportunity just to feel bad about something I'm doing. Embrace the truth, the fact that God and all of heaven rejoice when you trade up to his presence, when you trade up to his provision, all that he would offer, and you would trade up to his peace. Many of us are in that camp. The other camp is this. There's someone in this room who's dealing with the idea of whether you want to trade up to the life that God is offering for the very first time. And you can do that actually today. You do that by what? By embracing that your sin has separated you from a loving God and is asking him to forgive your sins through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And in so doing, you are willingly trading your current self-directed life for the one that will be led by a loving heavenly father who is doing what? Who is ready to run to you and assure you of your place with him. We would love to help you with that. And it's in the, the, these, one of these two camps that we're all, I think God's calling us all to something. And in that we understand what he would have for us. 
Every Sunday we have a, a, a very sacred moment at the end where we're calling for uh, this decision and reflection and the things that, that God would want from us. And this morning I am going to just challenge us, determine what camp you're in, and then ask God, God, where are you wanting me to go? What are you wanting me to do with this? How, what, what area of my life am I choosing not to trade up? And I, Father, I would do that. What, 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 area, what am I doing that's keeping me from that? And then this morning, that some, some real heart work would be done to do that. And, or if you're one who is, that is wanting to, to do that for the very first time, that you would, you would trust the Father to do so. You can do that right where you are. You can come talk to us. Staff will be up front to, to help you. Or we've got amazing people across the lobby at the Connection Center based on the very last phrase in, in the statement of this, and so your, your deal, a reminder that he who has God and everything else has no more than he who has God only. We think it's, it's about the other, everything else, but it's really truly about God. And this morning, I am challenging y'all as God has just been messing me up, that we would be willing to see repentance and through the lens of trading up to his way and not my way. Let me pray for us, and then uh, the worship team is going to come up and, and, and lead us in during our time of, of just reflection and decision. Let me pray. Father God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for all that you have taught us. I thank you for Luke 15, Father, uh, where Jesus could have done so many things, but he, he wanted to make sure the Pharisees saw his heart for the people he was with and to see how wrong they were. And Father, for us, as we walk through this and as we seek to figure out this concept of what it means to trade up, that Father, you would help us to do so in a way that honors you, but also brings life that you've been so desperately wanting to, to show us. For, for, because Father, you tell us, you, know, you have plans for us in the midst of the stuff of life, but it's one's plans to, to give us a hope and to give us a future. And Father, I pray that we would embrace that today, better, maybe better than we ever have. For those who are wired like me that have just been a performance mentality, Father, that you would break through that and you would help us to see, continue to see the beauty of what it means to take that step towards you and you running towards us with open arms. But I pray that you would use the next few moments of our life and this in the life of our church, Father, to meet us. And Father, for those who need courage to take a step, that they would do so with you or even out to, to speak to someone here at the, uh, the Connection Center. But God, I pray that you would, again, use this moment in a beautiful way. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand together as we, again, just spend some time with the Lord uh, under the direction of our worship team. I need you. Oh. Yes. 
as a congregation say, Lord, I, I need you. So today, that's, that's the first step of repentance, of trading up, is uh, that, that acknowledgement of what you have is better than what I'm, what I'm seeking or what I'm, I'm moving or what I'm living in. So I love that phrase, Kevin. Uh, I shared the first service, too, of, of um, sin is living to die and repentance is dying to live. So I would encourage you this week, I know I'm going to do this, I'm going to reflect on what Kevin um, shared this morning so effectively, is Lord, what, what are those areas in my life that I need to trade up, that I'm, I'm buying the lie that this is as good as it gets. There's so much more that God has for us. So I encourage you to do that as well. So thank you, Kevin, for sharing your heart today from the Lord. Lord, Lord let's give him a hand, just a shout out. So great. So proud of you and proud to be your friend and um, Kevin's just a real deal I love him love him being here so like he said if you have um, a question if you want to uh, trade up for salvation this morning um, Connection Center our connection team is over there and they'd be love uh, they'd uh, enjoy being with you this morning so um, thank you for being here today uh, I, uh, I said just on a real uh, like community small church feel I said hey when you do the greeting Tell, ask somebody if it's their birthday. So we have three guys in here that's their birthday, three special friends to me. So Ivan uh, is on our staff down here. Paul Broder is an incredible brother of mine. And then um, George back here. You might think an angel had visited back here if you're in this section. Uh, he's from Ghana, but he's in a complete white. And so I was like, George, you look like you've just come out of, out of heaven. So anyway, it's his birthday too. And uh, so anyway, just wish y'all a happy birthday. You're great. We don't do that for everybody, so don't next week email me and say, hey, it's my birthday next week. Okay, just, just let of the Lord, okay? Hey, love you. Have a great week, and uh, we'll see you Wednesday. See you tonight if you're coming Wednesday at Midland next week. Have a great week.